Hello and welcome. 70 years ago, the steamer Earl Thorfinn, on her round of the North Isles of Orkney, was hit by a hurricane and had to run before the wind towards Aberdeen. Captain Hamish Flett and his crew had to cope with mountainous seas that smashed the steering gear and conditions that destroyed other vessels that day, including the Stranraer to Larne ferry Princess Victoria. But the Thorfinn survived. Ship and crew showed the strength and fortitude of the 11th century North Earl of Orkney, after whom it was named. How did they get through the storm? And how has marine communication developed over the years to help in such situations? Professor Tom Stevenson is well-placed to tell the story, having a lifelong interest in technology and in Orkney life that goes back to his days growing up in Kwailu and then studying at Stromness Academy. He went on to a degree in physics at Aberdeen University, followed by a master's in instrument design. He went to Edinburgh to work for Ferranti, working on measuring systems for machine tools. And then he joined Edinburgh University's Wolfson Microelectronics Institute. He moved to the university's Department of Electrical Engineering. While working there, he took a part-time PhD. He was subsequently awarded a personal chair in microelectronics by the university. In retirement, he continues to be very active, particularly as chairman of the Museum of Communication in Burnt Island in Fife, and also, of course, in the Science Festival, where he keeps up his record of having spoken each year since the start. So, Tom, you are especially welcome, and we're looking forward to hearing from you the story of the Thorfinn and the Hurricane. Thank you very much, Howie, for that introduction, and I'm very pleased to present this lecture. It's a joint event with the Orkney Wireless Museum, and uh, some of you may recall, if you were around 10 years ago, that uh, we presented this lecture in Kirkwall Town Hall, and at that time, I was uh, assisted by Dorothy Branken of the Museum of Communication and Sandy Firth of the Orkney Wireless Museum. But today I'm doing it as a solo event. Now, this was an enormous storm which affected the whole of Britain. And what I'm going to do in this lecture is cover some of these points, talk about the weather conditions at the time, the loss of the Princess Victoria that uh, Howie mentioned in the introduction, give some technical information about the Earl Thorfinn and their epic voyage. And it'll be a bit technical because this is a science festival after all. And finally, uh, I talk about modern technology, uh, modern uh, marine technology, which has made a tremendous difference to marine safety, as you know. Now, the storm on the 31st of January, 1953, affected the whole of Britain and there was a storm surge in the North Sea, which I'll mention later, and it caused very severe flooding in the southeast of England, where over 300 people were drowned in their own homes because the sea level rose by something like six feet or more. The Stranraer Land Ferry sank with a loss of 133 lives. And in the low countries, so-called uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, the sea level rise there was about 10 feet or three meters, and over 1,800 people lost their lives. This was the greatest loss of life in peacetime that there has been in Europe, as far as I can recall. So it was a very big event, the like of which we have not seen since, thankfully. Now, as you might imagine, the weather conditions at the time have subsequently been analyzed ad nauseam by all sorts of experts. And hindsight is a great thing, but with the data available at the time, um, the weather charts were not as detailed as they are now, and the weather forecasts were not as good as they are now. But this is a, a weather chart from the UK Met Office, and it shows the conditions at midday on the previous day, that is the 30th of January, 1953. And we can see there is a deep low here between Iceland and Scotland. And this is a fairly typical situation. 
uh, these lows tend to come in from the Atlantic and they track typically in a northeasterly direction and disappear up into the Norwegian Sea. And as a result, Scotland is usually in a southwesterly airstream. So there was nothing special about the conditions uh, the day before, other than that it was a deep low. And it was expected that it would track northeast as they always did. Except in this case, it suddenly did a right turn when it was roughly abreast of Orkney and Shetland. This was not expected at all. And this is from uh, the Weather Channel website. And they've shown here the position at midday on the day before, and then at every six hours after that. And this is midday on the 31st of January. And you can see that by midday on the 31st of January, it was roughly opposite Aberdeen. And as you know, the air travels anti-clockwise around a, an area of low pressure. So there was a very strong northerly gale down the North Sea. And as this arrow shows here, the wind tends to blow the water in front of it. And you get what's called a storm surge. So there are two factors here. One is the very low atmospheric pressure causes the sea level to rise. There's less weight of air on top of it. And also the action of the wind on the surface blows the water of the wind and it can't escape through the English Channel fast enough. So it builds up along the coast of Belgium and Holland. And that's what caused the enormous loss of life. Now, I've got... Uh, some doubt as to the accuracy of these two positions here. I don't think those are correct. And the reason I say that is that at the time the Thorfinn left Kirkwall at seven in the morning, it was relatively calm. And that would imply that they were in the middle of the, or near the middle of the depression. Whereas according to this, at six in the morning, it was already way east of Orkney. I don't think that's right. But we'll ignore that for the moment. Now, again, since the event, people have looked at the um, data and from that have produced computer models of what happened in the North Sea. And this is a computer model, so it may not be correct, but it will give an indication. Now, the colors here indicate the height of the sea above normal sea level, and it's color coded. So if it's the same height as it, um, Always was, it's this kind of mid-blue color. And one meter higher, th these are centimeters, by the way, so one meter higher is green. And you see it goes right up to deep red, which is three meters or 10 feet higher than normal. And you can see that along the Dutch coast here, it is definitely deep red. So the sea level was 10 feet above normal. And this overwhelmed the dikes and sea defenses that they had put in. Now, before we come on to the Thorfinn, I'm going to talk about the Princess Victoria. This is a picture of her. She was a relatively modern ship built in 1948. She was an, oops, sorry. Let me go back. Um, she provided a regular service between Stranraer in southwest Scotland and Larn in Northern Ireland. And she had the mail contract on that route as well. She was an early roll-on, roll-off ferry, but she was loaded and unloaded entirely from the stern. There were no bow doors at all, and they had a turntable for drivers who were challenged and didn't want to reverse. She had a bow rudder for docking. Bow thrusters, which we have nowadays on ferries, had yet to be invented. She was fitted with wireless, but it was purely telegraphy, that is Morse code, dots and dashes. There was no radio telephone so that the, the captain could not speak to the captain of another ship or the shore. Everything had to go through a wireless operator and be converted into Morse code. She also had radar and she was diesel powered. So a thoroughly modern ship for the time. Now, I mentioned that she's loaded and unloaded through the stern, and I found these press photographs of the ship with the stern doors open. They weren't really doors, they were more like gates, 
they were not watertight and they were not very strong. Um, when they were closed, they were simply locked by dropping bolts down into holes in the deck, rather like you would with a farm gate. And they had a, an additional door above the hinge doors as a guillotine, a vertical sliding door, and that could be lowered and locked across the top of the two lower doors. But there was such a faff to use, it was hardly ever, in fact, put into use. Now, another thing that came out with hindsight was that the drainage of the car deck was inadequate. There were 18 drains, each about the diameter of a tennis ball, to allow any water spilt on the car deck to drain back into the sea. And this proved to be far too few and far too small. There had been a couple of previous incidents um, of flooding on the car deck. One was when two milk tankers had overturned in heavy weather and spilt 6,000 gallons of milk on the deck. And that took three quarters of an hour to drain out through the, the, the scuppers. And more seriously, in 1951, they had shipped some water, presumably through the stern doors, and they ended up with about six inches of water on the car deck. And that had taken an hour and a half to drain. And the ship had taken such a severe list that they were not able to dock until they had got rid of the water and the ship had gone back on an even keel. Now, on the morning of the 31st January, there was a gale warning. There had been a gale warning the night before, but they had a mail contract and the crew were under some pressure, I suppose, to comply with the mail contract. They left Stranraer at quarter to eight in the morning here, and they had to proceed up Loch Ryan with a headwind and a head sea. The wind was pretty well north-northwest and was getting stronger. It would usually take them half an hour to exit Loch Ryan, but this day, because of the headwind and head sea, it took over an hour. When they turned left towards Ireland, they were hit by a very heavy sea on the starboard side, and the captain, Captain Ferguson, decided the best plan was to turn back. So he did a U-turn. It's not very easy, but he did a U-turn to head back into Loch Ryan. Unfortunately, um, this meant that the stern of the ship was now exposed to the waves and the waves broke through the stern doors and they ended up with about two feet of water on the car deck. Now that, if you do the, the sums, is more than 450 tons of water. And water doesn't stand still. It sloshes around as the ship moves. So it is very, very dangerous. And the ship is in danger of capsizing in this situation. The captain decided that the best plan was to turn as quickly as possible, bow into the wind again to avoid any more sea going onto the car deck. So he did another U-turn and ended up facing back northwards into the wind heading out of Loch Ryan, and he decided that he would reverse all the way home to Stranra, keeping the ship bowed to the sea. He had a bow rudder. It was not normally used, but they tried to use it, but they found that the locking bolts, the locking pins had seized and they were unable to get the pins out. It was also very dangerous for crew to be out there because of the waves breaking over the bow. By this time, it was 9.30. He sent his first um, distress call out at 9.46, which said, Hove to off the mouth of Loch Ryan, vessel not under command, urgent assistance of a tug required. At that point, she was listing 15 degrees to starboard. Now, the distress call was picked up by Port Patrick Radio, which was one of the chain of coastal radio stations not far away and they alerted the emergency services. But the Princess Victoria was not stopped. He said hove to but to keep uh, steerage way on the engines were running and 
he was doing about five knots. Now, there were all sorts of communication problems which made the situation much more serious. The Coast Guard and the radio station were in adjacent buildings in Port Patrick, but they had no intercommunication. And because all the radio traffic was in Morse, the radio operator had to write down what the message was and take it next door to the Coast Guard, who then had to write a reply, which would then be taken back and transmitted back to the ship or to other ships who were looking. And radio operators could only transmit approved messages. So as you can imagine, this caused delay, unnecessary delay. At 10.32, the Princess Victoria sent out another distress call, four miles northwest of Coshwell, and the list was increasing. Now, at this stage, he had decided that if he couldn't reverse back down to Stranraer, his best plan was to head across to Larne, keep going on his normal route. The list was increasing. Now, at 12.17, radio stations and other ships managed to get a, a position fix on the Princess Victoria using directional aerials. This is a well-known technique where you get a, an angular bearing for the source of a radio transmission. And uh, if you've got two or more of these, you can draw lines on a chart and say where they intersect, that's where the transmitter is. And that gave the, the position of the ship as five miles north northeast of the Copeland Islands, which was not on the normal route. Now, whether that was transmitted to the Princess Victoria or not, we don't know. So these are the Copeland Islands <clears throat> on the Irish coast. And that's where they reckoned the Princess Victoria was at 17 minutes past 12. At half past one, the master gave the order to prepare to abandon ship. Five minutes later, they actually sighted the Irish coast on board the Princess Victoria. And at 1338, they sent another message giving their position as five miles east of the Copeland Islands. But sadly, at, at two o'clock, 1400, the ship sank with a loss of 133 lives. The local lifeboats and other ships did a tremendous job trying to rescue as many people as possible, but it was a very, very severe loss of life. And throughout this, the wireless operator on the Princess Victoria had stayed at his post. He was one of those who lost their lives, but he was awarded the George Cross afterwards. Now, what about the Thorfinn? Well, I can summarize the Thorfinn in this one slide, which is that they left Kirkwall, didn't quite get to Sandy, had to turn and run before the wind and ended up off Aberdeen and eventually docked in Aberdeen. And that was it. But that would be to miss out an awful lot of interesting detail. So we'll now go back to the morning of the 31st of January. Now, just before we do, um, we have an, an Air Thorfinn ship at the moment serving the North Isles of Orkney, built in 1989. And that ship is very typical of ships of that era. She's diesel powered with a speed of about 12 knots. And uh, it's an open car deck um, for both vehicles, freight, and indeed livestock. Now, the previous Earth Orphan is this one here. As you can see, there's smoke coming out the, the chimney. It's coal burning. And she was built in 1928 at Hall Russell Shipyard in Aberdeen. And uh, I've given the website reference here to where you can find technical information about the build. She was based on an ocean-going trawler design that was well established. Um, they'd been building these big trawlers for many years at Hall Russell. Um, 
And these are the trawlers that typically went to Greenland and Iceland, um, distant waters. It was a very robust design, a very well tried design, and it was adapted to produce a suitable ferry for Orkney. Her sister ship, Earl Sigurd, was very similar. This is some data, again, from the, the, the builder's files. Um, she had a speed of about 10 knots, could do a bit more maybe. Uh, a three-cylinder triple expansion steam engine, coal-fired. And she was about 45 metres long, which is similar in size to the current Earl Thorfinn. Now, you'll see here that um, this is a summary of the data from Hall Russell. And uh, it says this vessel made 11 knots on its trial trip and had accommodation for 250 passengers. It must have been quite crowded at that. The triple expansion engine, I, I've been unable to find what its rated horsepower was, but its rate of consuming fuel, because it was coal fired, was about one ton per hour. And if we assume that it was about 10% efficient, which is fairly typical of a steam engine, it probably had an output of about a megawatt or perhaps about 800 horsepower. But significantly, and even in 1953 at the time of the hurricane, they did not have radio and they did not have radar. The only means of signaling they had was a flashing Aldis signaling lamp and they also had signal flags, and they had a megaphone, loud hailer, to allow the captain to shout at people. But for long distance communication, they really had very little. This is a side view of the ship. The blue line here is the water line. And I'll just point out some of the relevant features. Here is the triple expansion engine. Here is the boiler. Uh, there is passenger accommodation here and a single screw um, at the stern and a single rudder. The rudder has steam power steering with the wire ropes and chains which run through tubes and eventually couple to the steering gear at the bridge. They have two lifeboats and a dinghy which is useful for putting anyone ashore or picking things up. Another side on view uh, of the bow. And you can see here we have two cargo holds and a lower deck, which was used for livestock and cargo, a steam derrick. And these two doors on each side, there were two sliding doors, you can see that they run on track at the bottom here. And this, when open, gave an aperture that was about eight feet wide. And this was used to load livestock if the pier height was correct, or if it was a, an angle slipway. And for handling cargo, it was very handy to have these doors on either side of the ship, which could be opened if required. And they would play a part in what was about to happen. This is a plan view of the ship now. Here we can see the, 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 the boiler and, and the funnel. And on each side of the boiler, there are these um, storage bunkers for coal. And they could take about 25 tonnes on each side. So they had a total fuel capacity of about 50 tonnes. We can see here the, the first class um, passenger accommodation. They had a coal-fired stove in the galley so that they could do cooked meals. Now, here's an animation that I found on the web of a triple expansion steam engine. And I think it's a rather fun animation. Basically, what happens is the high temperature, high pressure steam comes in from the boiler here. And the steam valve um, directs this to the high pressure cylinder to push it down and then push it back up. 
and the exhaust from the high pressure cylinder becomes the supply to the intermediate pressure cylinder, which in turn supplies the low pressure cylinder. And you'll notice that the pistons are a different size. The areas are scaled to suit the pressure. So that the force on the crank, on each of the three cranks, is pretty well balanced. So that's a triple expansion engine, which gives um, better efficiency than just a straight loss system. After this cylinder, it goes to the condenser, where it's condensed back to water and goes back into the boiler. Now, as you know, the shipping forecast uh, is broadcast regularly on radio in very measured tones, so it can be heard clearly in static and interference conditions. And Orkney is in area Fair Isle. And the, there was a gale warning for the 31st of January, but on the morning, about seven o'clock in the morning when they were ready to sail, the weather was not too bad. It was relatively calm. There were heavy snow showers from time to time, which reduced visibility, but otherwise it was not too bad a morning, but the forecast was not good. Now, Captain Hamish Flett, who was, I think, 33 at the time, with 12 crew and 10 passengers, set forth from Kirkwall. His cargo was two bulls and four pigs. The four pigs and the two bulls were on the lower deck in the area called Twin Decks. Some of the passengers had come from Aberdeen and had come up on the north boat and had crossed the pier and gone on board the Thorfinn to go to Sandy. They'd had a cooked breakfast, in fact. The steward had made them a cooked breakfast. And if we look at this um, modern tourist map of Orkney, here's Kirkwall, and the route to Sandy was just north of Stronsey, and the pier then was at T Kettletoft in the middle of the island, not where it is today at the southern end. But when they were between Stronsey and Sandy, by this time the wind had got up, and they found that they could not make headway against the wind. Even with maximum power, they were in danger of being blown backwards and running ashore on Stronsey. So Captain Flett, in consultation with his chief engineer, Duncan Manson, decided that the only option they had was to turn and run before the wind and try to steer east to avoid Stronsey. Sandy was giving them very little shelter because Sandy is very low lying. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. And the waves were now um, so big that the propeller was coming out of the water and the engine was racing. So the engineer had to stand by the throttle and close the throttle rapidly when the propeller came out of the water and then open it full when the propeller went back into the water. So having decided to turn downwind, they had to head basically southeast. Now, this is a picture of a uh, start point in Sandy, and you can see that it is very low lying. From the air, it's even more dramatic. Um, it's basically flat. So there's going to be very little shelter from the land on Sandy. Now, as soon as they turned downwind, waves started to break over the stern and they ended up with an awful lot of water on the lower deck. And like the Princess Victoria, this is a very dangerous situation. And Hamish Flett then took a very wise decision, which was to open the side doors, each side of the hatches for the hold. And that gave two eight foot wide apertures, one on each side, so that the water that came in over the stern could escape over the side. So they did not end up with an enormous weight of water on the deck. The animals on the in the pens were in danger of drowning at some point. They were there was up to about four feet of water where they were standing prior to opening the doors. When they were just east of Auskerry, they were hit by three huge waves in succession. And this almost capsized them, but more seriously, the power steering failed. Basically, the 
the chain that went round the sprocket in the power steering mechanism had stretched so much there was slack in it and the slack chain became jammed in the mechanism. They were then in extreme danger that the next wave would capsize them, especially if the ship broached too. And then the captain took another very sensible decision. He called for the engine to be put full astern. This was a bit like putting the brakes on, but it had the effect of keeping the ship tail on to the wind. Meanwhile, they were trying to free the steering mechanism from the power steering so that they could manually steer using a big wooden wheel. They managed to do this eventually, at which point the engine went full ahead again. And that's how they operated uh, for the rest of the period until they got to Aberdeen, manual steering um, and basically trying to keep the ship as upright as possible. Now, during this time, the fire in the galley stove had been put out by seawater coming down the chimney. The engine room crew were being soaked with water coming down the ventilators and they had very little to eat and drink. Um, I believe they just had some cold soup. Once they got into calmer water off Aberdeen, they were able to relight the stove. But um, for the major part of the voyage, uh, they had basically water and not much else. So let's look at the timeline now. At the time they turned uh, and headed downwind from Sandy was about half past eight in the morning. The first land that they saw was Canaird Head Lighthouse. And by this time, it was seven o'clock at night. They tried to signal to the lighthouse using their signaling lamp, but the sea was so rough and the motion was so violent, they could not keep the signaling lamp pointed at the lighthouse and they were unable to communicate with the lighthouse. The next lighthouse they came past was Rattray Head. They tried again to signal to the lighthouse without success. So there was no knowledge of the Thorfinn from the time she left Kirkwall at seven in the morning. All this time, this is now 12 hours later. And eventually at about 9.30 at night, they ended up off Aberdeen Harbour. And a great sigh of relief, but again, they had no means of communication. Aberdeen Harbour was closed because of the conditions. They were, the conditions were so rough. And they and any other ships that are out there had to basically stooge about, as I say. In other words, steam slowly in big circles, um, keeping steerage way on until the harbour opened. Now, as it turned out, the harbour did not open until the next day. And they were supposed to wait for a pilot to take them into the harbour. They had another problem. They were running out of fuel. They'd had about 30 tonnes of coal on board when they left Kirkwall. And they now used most of it. And they realised that if they didn't go into harbour soon, they were going to run out of power. They would run out of steerage way and they would be in a worse predicament. And because Captain Flett had been in and out of Aberdeen lots of times and he knew it well, he decided that he was going to go in no matter what. So he waited till a trawler went in and he just steamed in behind the trawler. And uh, they made it when they were literally using the floor sweepings from the bunkers to keep the engine going. This is a picture from the present journal taken the next day of the passengers on board, uh, some of whom, as I said, had left Aberdeen um, the day before. But they were mighty relieved um, to be back on, on dry land. This is a picture of the crew, a commemorative picture taken at the time. Most of the crew stayed on the island of Westry 
Uh, this is Captain Flett here. Um, this is his chief engineer, um, Duncan Manson, who was my uncle. Um, Jackie Bain, the steward. And the cabin boy who had just joined the ship at Christmas. And this was uh, a huge adventure and uh, not one that he would want to repeat, I think. The Earth Orphan stayed in service. <clears throat> she was repaired within a week, which I think is quite remarkable. Most of the deck furniture had been smashed or ripped away. Um, the lifeboats were damaged. The dinghy was damaged. But within a week at Hall Russell's yard, she was back in service um, and ready to go back to Orkney. And she remained <clears throat> afloat until February 63, when she was broken up at a scrapyard at Bowness on the 4th. This is a picture of her beached at the 4th, ready to be broken up. Now, there was an enormous amount of storm damage in Kirkwall and in Orkney in general. This is a picture of the Air Road um, looking towards Kirkwall Pier. So this is looking east, if you like. And you can see that the road has been very severely smashed up by the sea. Again, with the northerly gale, there was an enormous storm surge which would go over the city wall and everything was broken up. Um, Tom Rendell and colleagues will be talking more about this uh, later tonight. But the major loss in Orkney was, in fact, poultry. Orkney at that time was a major producer of eggs. And a lot of the hens were in wooden hen houses out in the fields, and these simply disappeared. They were just blown away and disappeared. And it was estimated that something like 85,000 hens were killed. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, we did this lecture in 2013, the 60th anniversary, in Kirkwall Town Hall on, I think, a Tuesday afternoon. And we had a capacity crowd. You can he see Tom Rendell here. Um, and shortly before the lecture began, Sandy first said, you'll never know who's arrived, Captain Hamish Flett with his daughter. So we tried to persuade him to come down the front and take part in the event, but he, he refused. Uh, he wanted to sit up at the back. And afterwards, we went back to speak to him. And we tentatively asked, well, what did you think of it? And he said, well, it wasn't a bad but you should have given more credit to the crew and in particular to the chief engineer. I did not tell him that the chief engineer was, was my uncle. So we, we did a reasonable job, I think, in 2013. There was a Thanksgiving service in Westry um, after it was all over, uh, which was very well attended. And Captain Flett was known nominated for uh, an honour in the Queen's Honours List, but he refused unless it also went to his crew. Now, what about today? <clears throat> well, in 2012, I was lucky enough to have a trip on the Hamnival on the bridge across the Pentland from Stromness to Scrabster with Captain Willie Mackay. And this is the Hamnabo, she was then in a previous paint job. And the first thing you notice is the communications. She has two types of radar, various whip aerials here for VHF communication, and these domes for satellite communication. Under the water, there is sonar to measure the water depth, and there are bow thrusters as well for maneuverability. No bow rudders. Now, in the olden days, everything was manual. Visual bearings for position, a compass for to steer by, and if you're lucky, an Aldous lamp for signaling. Nowadays, <clears throat> we have satellites, electronic communication. We have satellite navigation. We have weather observations and good weather forecasting. We have the Ship Automatic Information System, AIS, which you may use yourselves on the web. 
and we have automatic distress beacons. You don't have a radio operator as the Princess Victoria had. You have a communications desk, which has all the various methods of communication available to the crew. You have radio telephony, so you do not have to use Morse code. In fact, Morse code is not used anymore. Here's some pictures taken on the bridge. This is the central console on the bridge, which has a computer screen here with a lot of information about propulsion, speed, uh, wind, tide, all that sort of thing. Uh, the controls for the engines. And here um, is Ivor Mackay, who was first officer at that time, using a VHF radio. And on the large screen here, there is a map. And the ship is on autopilot. No one is steering it. It's following a pre-programmed track on the satellite navigation system. The crew have to keep a lookout, their major uh, task is to keep an eye open for what else is going on and to that end there are several pairs of binoculars on the bridge. I asked the captain what happens if you have a sudden electrical failure and all these screens go blank and he said come this way and we went out onto one of the wings of the bridge where the major controls for steering and propulsion are duplicated and in a drawer here, there are paper charts, pencils, and rulers. And here is a compass, a sighting compass, that can take bearings on landmarks or lighthouses or whatever. So even in the event of total power failure, they can go back to the old ways and pinpoint where they are, assuming they can see the landmarks. It was a beautiful day the day that I was on the bridge. This is taken from uh, one of the wings of the bridge looking astern back towards Hoy. And Willie Mackay said, on a nice summer's day, this is the best job in the world. But it's not always so nice. Now, if you go onto YouTube and put in Hamnavo 9th January 2014, you will find a video clip taken from the shore of the Hamnavo going out Hoy Sound on its trip to Scrabster on what we would call a Kush day. Now, I'm not going to try to show the video because I've got limited experience of that on PowerPoint, all of it bad. So what I do have here are a few frame grabs from the um, video. And at this point, which is at about one minute, 40 seconds in, there's a rather nasty looking lump of water here heading towards the ship. Now, to get an idea of scale, the Hamnavo is 112 metres long and the bridge is probably about 20 metres above the waterline. And in the next picture, watch what happens. That wave hits the starboard bow very hard indeed and it breaks right up over the bridge. Now, the ship was on course at that point, heading out Hoy Sound. But this lump of water hitting it had a very dramatic effect. And you can see that she's now slewed round, I'm guessing, 30 or 40 degrees off course um, and is heading in quite the wrong direction. But of course, she recovers um, and there was no disaster. But it does show um, the power of the sea. And at that point, I'll stop and thank you for supporting the 2023 Orkney International Science Festival. I hope I've covered the story in a reasonable way. And I think what I now need to do is to stop sharing my screen and go back onto normal video. Let's see if I can do that successfully. Yes, well, I've managed well, it. Well done, Tom. What a fascinating story. Um, a number of questions immediately come in. And there's this one about the whole communications the fact that the Thorfinn had such a limited um, communications, no no radio, and actually the Princess Victoria, a big ferry ship on a, a big route, actually was limited to Morse code and no radio tele 
telephone. What yeah. was the, the problem? Was it just that the technology wasn't available or was it too expensive or what was the reason? I'm not sure. I think possibly, um, I mean, radio telephony, voice communication by radio had been around for a long time. Um, and I think maybe um, it was cost. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at the overall cost, they had to have a radio officer on board for more. Uh, with radio telephony, the captain could do it, or the first officer or anyone could could use the radio telephone. But um, traditionally, they'd had a radio officer who um, did the Morse code, known as Sparks, usually. Um, and uh, that had been in place since the days of the Titanic. Um, but the fact that the... Uh, the Thorfinn had no radio at all, absolutely none, um, was really quite serious. And even when they ended up off Aberdeen, um, they were presumably spotted off Aberdeen eventually, but the telephone lines were down with the storm and the folk in Orkney didn't hear that the Thorfinn was okay until I think after 11 o'clock at night on the 31st, that the a word was eventually got back to Orkney that the Thorfinn had appeared off Aberdeen. Um, although at that stage she was still at, at sea, but she was within sight of land. So the, the telephone lines were down as well, which made life even more difficult. And in those times, there was, well, like on land anyway, the shortwave radio and there was the, the radio amateurs in those days. So it wasn't as if the, the technology wasn't available and usable. That's right. And in fact, uh, that's just reminding me of something very important, that there's now a radio amateur emergency network called RAYNET, R-A-Y-N-E-T. And this is uh, radio amateurs who have registered to be part of an emergency network in the event of, uh, you know, catastrophic weather or catastrophic events. That was set up after the 1953 hurricane. Um. There was such loss of life in Southeast England and elsewhere. And again, they had communication problems because telephone systems were knocked out and so on. But there were radio amateurs, but unless they're organized into a network to relay messages, it doesn't work. You know, one radio amateur on his own is, is no good. You, you need to have lots of them over an area so that you can communicate. And I believe that Raynet was set up in later in 1953. And I guess organization and system come into it in various ways. Like when you were talking about um, the coast guards and the, the radio being in, in separate units. That's right. Yes. And um, you can just imagine um, the situation where the operator w was not allowed to use his own initiative and compose a reply. He had to get it approved by an officer, presumably, um, and then translate it back into Morse and transmit it back and wait for the reply. Um, the, the whole thing, you know, is just almost bound to fail. And certainly, at worst, at best, it's going to cause delay, needless delay. And did this whole sequence of events in 1953 have an effect on people's attitude to the, the Met Office and the importance of the Met Office and weather forecasts and, and communication? Well, I think so, yes. And uh, the thing is, nowadays, we are so much better off that um, at that time, the only data that the Met Office had for what was going on in the Atlantic came from weather ships or from uh, merchant ships who would transmit back weather information as, and where they were. So from that, they produced um, their weather charts with isobars and um, pressures and so on. And uh, a lot of it was guesswork, filling in the blanks because they did not have measurements from these points. Whereas nowadays we have satellites, lots and lots of satellites orbiting, um, giving us up-to-date information on, on the weather conditions. And as a result, the weather forecast now over about three days is pretty good. And um, beyond three days, it's not very good. 
for all sorts of reasons, but out to about three days is is, is reasonably accurate. Something that also comes through in this story is the sheer physical challenge that, that the crew of the Thorfinn had to cope with. I was thinking, for instance, manual steering. So that meant physically they had to effectively control the movement of the rudder. That's right. And uh, it was done with um, a traditional ship steering wheel, which I guess was about four feet in diameter, with a, a gear at the centre going on to a sort of bicycle chain type arrangement. Um, and the, it took four men to um, apply, apply enough force. And of course, if the waves didn't hit the rudder end on, but slightly side on, there was a terrific shock loading on the on the mechanism. And uh, they'd had to, before the steering failed, they'd had problems with the 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 wire ropes and the chain stretching, and they had screw adjusters to to take up the slack. And um, I know that uh, Duncan Manson had gone out and tightened up the the screw adjusters several times, um, but they were taking such a hammering that eventually there was too much slack and the, and the chain um, came off the sprocket, as it were, and jammed in the mechanism. And that's that was the real emergency that they had when they were roughly opposite Auskerry, just east of Auskerry. So but going out, to, going out to adjust the, the, to take the slack out of the chains was a very dangerous operation because the place where that had to be done was on the lower deck, just inboard of the rudder. Um, and that's where um, they were exposed to the sea. And I was thinking, too, of the, that figure you gave of one tonne of coal an hour needs yes. to keep the boiler going. And now yeah. to shovel physically, to shovel one tonne of coal an hour and to shovel it in such conditions, what a challenge. Indeed. I mean, it's it's very hard work. Um to shift a ton of anything in an hour <laughs> is quite hard work, um, but uh, and with this kind of motion that they were uh, subjected to, it must have been extremely difficult. Uh, and also, the, this the sea was coming down the ventilators, um, and they were they were soaked completely soaked in seawater. Um, so it was a very unpleasant um, situation. And something else that comes through the story is just the ability to think quickly and how Hamish Flett, in a number of key points, That's had right. to make a very fast decision and he got it absolutely spot on. Yes. Well, the thing is, um, when they were hit by these waves and almost capsized and the steering gear uh, seized up, the next big wave would have probably come along in about 15 seconds. One of the things I remember from working with Stephen Salter on wave power, he used to say that the period of a North Atlantic storm waves is typically about 15 seconds. So they had about 15 seconds to prevent the ship going side on to the next wave. So that's why they had to go full astern as fast as they could and keep the engine full astern um, to act as almost like a drogue to keep it tail on to the wind and tail on to the sea. Um, and they had to leave it going full astern uh, until they managed to sort out the manual steering mechanism. I don't know how long that took, um, but the engine must have taken a real hammer in to, to be going full astern uh, in, in, in those conditions. And I guess we can only imagine that the sheer relief they would have felt at getting into Aberdeen Harbour. And then, of course, the sheer relief in Orkney when the, the news came. That's right. Yes. What? Yeah, it, amazing it was obviously a very anxious time for, for the families in, in Orkney because they had literally disappeared. They were, it was unknown. And uh, something I forgot to mention was that uh, when they left, Kirkwall at seven o'clock that morning, just before they left, a deep sea trawler left heading for Iceland. It was never seen again. And a lot of ships were lost. Um, not just the Princess Victoria, quite a lot of ships were lost. And certainly there was a trawler, I think it was from Fleetwood or somewhere, I might be wrong on that, um, 
heading for the Iceland fishing grounds, and it literally disappeared. It was never heard of again. So, What an incredible achievement to survive. Tom, thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating story, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you in future festivals. In the meantime, thank you again, and goodbye for now. Bye. Thank you.